broadcast service provided by the Remnant Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In the name of Jesus Christ, we welcome you and are glad you have chosen to worship with us. Worshiping the Lord is an expression of faith, and that expression is even stronger when we make the effort to be together. Our Lord desires a gathered people, and we hope the time will be soon that we can be together again. We are so thankful for the broadcast services that help to bridge the gap created by the social distancing. One very important expression of faith we all can make is our financial contributions. Let us continue to be diligent in our response to the Lord and his love shown to each of us. Next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday, and we hope you will plan to join us again. High Priest Ralph Damon will be the speaker. Tonight our speaker is High Priest Eddie Gates. He is currently the presiding elder at the Center Congregation, and those that know him see him as a gentle soul, yet one who is steady and one who stands on a sure foundation. He loves the Lord and desires to serve him. And we look forward to his message he has prepared here tonight. Let us now be called to worship by these words of the Apostle Paul to the Romans. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed through faith on his name. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Our opening hymn is hymn number 371 in our hymn book, God is my strong salvation. thankful that we have this opportunity to assemble together and to hear your, your preached word. We are thankful, O Lord, for your gospel restored. And as we've come this evening on this Palm Sunday, we reflect as we think of the multitude in Christ's time. Think of the joy and the praises that were rendered and yet realize that uh, by the end of the week, they uh, did not know thee. 
Oh Lord, we pray that as we have come that you would forgive us of our sins and help us to grow in our faith and to be on a sure foundation with thee. We pray that your spirit would bless our brother as he stands to share tonight. May our hearts be tuned to receive that which has been prepared. And we ask it in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. The scripture reading tonight comes from Esther, the fourth chapter, starting on the 16th verse, <clears throat> sorry, the 15th verse. Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. I'm sorry, 14th verse. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan. And fast ye for me, neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Our next hymn is hymn number 400 in the hymn book. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life.
They certainly are peculiar times and surreal, but I'm glad to be with you tonight, even if we're not together physically, we can still be together. And I hope that through this time of separation, we can actually grow closer. In the scripture reading, We heard Esther's reply to Mordecai, and the story of Esther is fascinating. It's found in the Old Testament about how God used one woman to save her people. Her parents died, and she was raised by her uncle, Mordecai. And he was fond of her and, and challenged her thinking along the way. As it would happen, the king... Xerxes deposed his wife because she didn't come when he called her. Now, probably wouldn't happen like that today, but I suppose customs were different, and he was the king. So young women were brought in from around the country to essentially audition the part for the queen. And Esther was chosen as one of them. And the person in charge of these women uh, grew fond of Esther. And, and for about a year, they spent time prepping them, getting them ready to act like a queen, giving them perfumes and special food. And each girl was pampered in preparation to meet the king. Ultimately, Esther is chosen. And then the real drama begins. Haman was one of the king's uh, trusted advisors. He decided to tell the king what we should do is pick one day and kill all the Jews. And the king said, okay, we'll do that. So Mordecai said, Esther, look, you have to say something. Because if not, it's going to be bad. It's going to be real bad. And she was conflicted. She was afraid. She was concerned. She was fearful for two reasons. One, she hadn't actually told anyone that she was a Jew. And so her advocating for the Jews would essentially out herself. And two, she hadn't been summoned to appear before the king in over 30 days. And so, again, that was a, pu a punishment uh, by death. Mordecai says to her, if 
if you remain silent, relief and deliverance for the Jews may come from another place, but your, you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. The story continues with Esther developing a plan that would expose Haman, save the Jews, and essentially earn her a place in history. But what will your story be? What will our story be? How would you tell this, your story, if you knew this verse was about you? Who knows, but you have come to this place for such a time as this. If you were to look at our current situation and apply that thinking to how it would affect your life, what would you do differently? How would you spend your time? How would you spend your money? How would you treat your coworkers, your family, your friends? You have come to this place in time for such a time as this. God's planning is never random. His purpose for you and your life were set in place before you were born. We're reminded in the book of Ephesians, the first chapter, the fourth verse. He hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. I tell you again, God has created you for such a time as this. Jeremiah 1 and 5. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. She exercised great faith. She called upon her friends for their prayerful support, even fasting. She relied upon the Lord. And she said, if I perish... I perish. The fear was gone. There's another story that takes place in the Book of Mormon in the 26th chapter of Alma. I'm going to pick up around the 118th verse or so when we get to the, the, the telling of their taking of the city of Manti, or Manti. And previously they had taken the city of Antipara and Kumini, and Helaman and his sons, as he called them, young men, 2,000 of them, great faith. Their mothers taught them. They believed it. They exercised their faith. They lived by it. He was amazed that through the, the battles that they had been through, they hadn't lost a single life. He said, and now their preservation, this is the Alma 26, 102 and 103. And now their preservation was astonishing to our whole army, yea, that they should be spared while there was a thousand of our brethren who were slain, the Lamanites. And we do justly ascribe it to the miraculous power of God because of their exceeding faith in that which they had been taught to believe, that there was a just God, and whosoever did not doubt that they should be preserved by his marvelous power. Did you catch the stipulation there? No doubt. No fear. So, after he'd taken these two cities and went to Manti, the army that the Lamanites had there was massive. 
He says they were innumerable. And he knew if they tried to overtake them in their defensive strongholds, it would be certain death. So he sent a letter to the governor of Zarahemla. And he said, here's what's going on. We need help. Please send us provisions, food, and most of all, reinforcements. And they waited. And they could see the Lamanites' supply line was just flowing freely. They were getting provisions every day. They got reinforcements. And there they were in the wilderness waiting for help from the governor. In Alma 26, 130, he says, And now the cause of these embarrassments, or the cause why they did not send more strength unto us, we knew not. Therefore we were grieved and also filled with fear, lest by any means the judgments of God should come upon our land to our overthrow and our utter destruction. Therefore we did pour out our souls in prayer to God that he would strengthen us and deliver us out of the hands of our enemies, yea, and also give us strength that we might retain our cities and our lands and our possessions for the support of our people. Yea, and it came to pass that the Lord our God did visit us with assurances that he would deliver us, insomuch that he did speak peace to our souls, and did grant unto us great faith, and did cause us that we should hope for our deliverance in him. The governor only sent 2,000 men and some provisions. So even with the 2,000 he had, they were still vastly outnumbered. There's still no way to mount an offensive that would be successful in defeating the strongholds that the Lamanites had set up in Manti. So Helaman devised a plan, a strategy. And they pitched their tents near the Manti border, where the wilderness bordered the city. The Lamanites saw them, and they sent out spies to see how many there were, and perhaps try to ascertain why, why they were there. What were they thinking? And the spies went out and came back with the reports and said, there's not that many of them. We can take them. I think they're probably trying to upset our supply lines. Well, this infuriated the Lamanite commander, and he said, we're going after them. We're going to take them out. They've been a pain in our side. We're going, to, we're going to take care of them right now. And so he got his entire army prepped to go after this smaller group that Helaman had. And Helaman saw this. And he said, Gid... Take a small squad with you and go and hide in the woods. Tiamner, take a small squad with you and go hide in those woods. And they waited. And the Lamanite commander marched forward towards them. And Helaman waited as if they were anticipating the battle about to begin. And right before they made contact, Helaman called retreat, and they fled back into the wilderness. And this infuri infuriated the Lamanites more, and they went after them. And as they did, they passed by Gid and his squad, and Tianmer and his squad, and they kept going. And so those two made their way to Manti, where there were only a couple of guards left behind, and easily overtook them. Meanwhile, the rabbit has gone into the woods, and the hounds have taken chase. 
Now, Helaman started heading towards the city of Zarahemla, and when the Lamanite commander realized this, he said, we're not going to fight that battle. We're not going to die on that hill. We'll just turn around and go back to Manti. And night came, and so he decided, we'll pitch our tents. We're tired. We've been running all day. Not worried about Helaman. They're tired, too. They're not going to do anything in the middle of the night. So they went to sleep. Meanwhile, Helaman and his army snuck back around them, back to the city of Manti, and joined up with Gid and Tiamner, and were able to take the city without the shedding of blood. Imagine the surprise on their faces when the Lamanites showed up the next day, expecting to walk back into the city that they'd occupied, only to see thousands of Nephites now occupying the strongholds, those trenches, those, those bunkers, those towers. And they were sore afraid, exceedingly afraid, that they fled, even left the entire quarter of the land. And as people do after the dust settles, conversations come up. And they're trying to figure out why the governor Zarahemla only sent a couple thousand men. And finally, Helaman said, verse 163, it matters not. We trust God will deliver us, notwithstanding the weakness of our armies, yea, and deliver us out of the hands of our enemies. But behold, they have received many wounds. Nevertheless, they stand fast in that liberty wherewith God has made them free. So they didn't come out of it unscathed. They suffered many wounds, but they were blessed because of their faithfulness and their reliance upon God. And they are strict to remember the Lord their God from day to day. Yea, they do observe to keep his statutes and his judgments and his commandments continually. And their faith is strong in the prophecies concerning that which is to come. May the same be said of us. You see, character is revealed when we're tested. That test often comes in the shape of conflict or trials. Sometimes someone is put into a position of power suddenly, unexpectedly. as it was with Esther. But what we do in a crisis depends on what we've been doing all along. The ordinary routine of our daily lives. We can't cut ourselves off from the past. There is a continuity in our lives such that the habits we have formed play a huge role in the condition or the size of our spiritual reserve. Every day we live, we're either increasing that reserve, which we can call upon in the future, or we're spending our spiritual capital, living morally beyond our means. So when a crisis comes, we struggle and we're afraid, and we're fearful. The careful steward who saves his earnings and stores them in a safe or a bank is able, when adversity comes, to ease the difficulty by falling back on that surplus which he has accumulated. If, as each morning dawns, if we've met 
every duty as it calls us or face every temptation as it attacks us as if it were a duty to be performed or a temptation to be resisted out of regard to the Lord Jesus Christ. We will add to our store of strength for the confronting of what may yet still be. Ephesians 6, verses 5 and 6. Paul says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart, as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. But if we go through our lives seeking only ease and our personal gratification, indulging in some evil ambition or appetites, we're only weakening ourselves, making ourselves so much less reliable when trials come. So that to have to face a time like Esther, or like Helaman, we would be in dire straits. But saints, this is the message to you. Do not fear. Isaiah 41.10 Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Hallelujah. And in Joshua 1, 9, have I not commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. In 1 John chapter 4, in the 4th verse and the 18th verse. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. He's speaking about the, that spirit of Antichrist. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. In Matthew chapter 6, he tells us how much worth worrying is. And your heavenly Father will provide for you whatsoever things you need for food, what you shall eat, and for raiment, what he shall put on. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought. It means do not fear, do not worry for your life, for what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your bodies, what you shall put on. Is not life more than meat and the body raiment? Are you worried about where your sustenance will come from? Are you worried about zinc, toilet paper? Having gloves and masks? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? How much more will he not feed you? Wherefore, take no thought. Do not fear for these things. But keep my commandments, which I have given thee. For which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? All the worrying in the world will not affect a single thing 
except your blood pressure. And those around you. And I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Therefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he not provide for you if ye are not of little faith? Therefore, take no thought. Do not fear, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Behold, I say unto you that your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. Wherefore, seek not the things of this world, but seek ye first to build up the kingdom of God and to establish his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. Do not fear what comes tomorrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto this day shall be the evil thereof. Let us be cheerful in our warfare. How happy a people we ought to be. James 1, 2 through 4. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into many afflictions, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, Wanting nothing. Our hope, our only hope, is in Jesus Christ. John sixteen thirty three. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. And you fall into that category. Doctrine and Covenants, section 151, 5b. Even though wars, rumors of wars, political unrest, and moral decay are all around you, be not discouraged, for lo, I am with you to the end. My work will not be frustrated. And be assured, you are among those chosen to bring to pass my kingdom in these last days. Doctrine and Covenants, section 152, paragraph 5. How soon you, my saints, have forgotten counsel not so long ago regarding economic adversity, political unrest, decline in morality, and natural calamities. These things have now come to pass and are with you. Heed again this counsel and make the required preparation for the much tribulation to come in the days ahead. And finally, Doctrine and Covenants 157, 6D. You have desired my kingdom on the earth, even Zion, and have accomplished many good things in righteousness and in temporalities. But you, my remnant saints, have been warned about the coming tribulations and now need to be further strengthened spiritually for that which is to come. The secular world is closing in around you, Soon you will lose many freedoms. 
not only in your daily lives, but even in your worship. Be aware and stand strong in your convictions. Let not the wiles of the adversary overcome you. Put on the whole armor of God. But even in these turbulent times, take comfort and be of good cheer. For in my gospel is found peace, comfort, and joy. Lo, I am with you always. You have come to this place for such a time as this. God's planning is never random. His purpose for you and your life were set in place before you were born. God created you for such a time as this. Our closing hymn is not found in our hymn book, but it's one that's very familiar to, I think, all of us. It's uh, standing on the promises of God. So feel free to join in and sing as you hear the Restoration Chorale sing this beautiful hymn. Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises Standing on the promises Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing on the promises Standing on the promises I'm standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, I'm standing on the promises of God. Promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing on the Standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises I cannot fall Listening every moment to the Spirit's call Resting in my Savior as my all in all Standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises Standing on the promises Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises. I'm standing on the promises. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for this time together. We're thankful, O oh Lord, that you hear our prayers and that you bring thoughts and songs, scriptures together that might strengthen us and comfort us. We're thankful for your servant who has uplifted us, given us a reason to be encouraged and uh, to have that hope. And Father, we are thankful for 
the opportunity to exercise our faith in thee in these the latter days for such a time as this. We pray, Father, that your spirit would bless us as we go forward. Please protect us. Help us to be strengthened. And to always look to thee, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.